So every successful company, every marketing agency, every salesman who's trying to sell you something, every politician who's trying to get your vote knows that stories are powerful. They're extraordinarily powerful. If you didn't catch it, that was a gum commercial. <laughs> and it almost made me cry. <clears throat> Three times. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of, of hours are spent every year trying to connect with you and I in a, a unique way, in a way that stands out, perhaps even in a way that resonates with us on a deeper level. Increasingly, companies and politicians are leaning towards stories to win you over. And the end product is commercials like that one. And we actually had to choose between a lot of them because I wanted to, wanted to show you like six or seven, but the rest of the staff was like, don't do that. And so <clears throat> we didn't. Now, there are people in this room that connected with that in, a, in an engaging way and maybe even a unique way. You might have uh, felt a little tear uh, even because it's a really powerful. I mean, it was like, it's like a minute long and it tells a lifelong story and it kind of wraps you up in it. And then it has that, you know, point at which it kind of hits you. And when it hits you, uh, it does something that almost nothing else can do. Stories do that. And uh, so this morning, I want to talk about story, the power of story. And I'm really interested in kind of understanding why stories hit us like that. Why is it the stories engage with us on a more profound level than almost anything else? So before I go forward, I kind of want to define what a story is, kind of like what I mean when I say story. I mean that a story is a collection of beliefs about life that shape who we are. A collection of beliefs maybe about God, about ourselves, about the world that shape who we are. And they're extraordinarily powerful in shaping our behaviors. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a parallel story. There's two, two stories about the same thing that uh, maybe there might be people in this room that believe both of them, but this is a tension that we're feeling right now in our culture. Our founding fathers were incredible storytellers and they passed on uh, from generation to generation the story about a group of people who came to a new land that they might create something different, something that's never been done before, a land full of freedom, a land full of opportunity, where it did not matter what your background was. You could have the dream. You could make something of yourself. That all of us were endowed with certain unalienable rights by our creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And generations afterwards fought. They risked their lives. They put their lives on the line. They died to preserve that dream of freedom and opportunity. About 40 years ago, a group of people began telling an alternative story, a competing story about the uh, beginnings of America. And it's a story about American conquest and colonial imperialism. It's a story that sees America not as people who are pursuing freedom from oppression, but as the oppressors themselves. It tells the story uh, of a nation that became so arrogant and so prideful that they began to stick their noses in places where they did not belong get involved in things that they should never have been involved in, and they became hated and despised by the world. Now understand those two competing stories and then think about the tension that we sense, that we understand is happening in Washington right now. What's happening is that there are two groups of people that believe competing stories about America. Stories are extraordinarily powerful in shaping who we are, what we believe, uh, who we'll hang out with, who we associate ourselves with, what we do with our schedules, 
how we spend our money, maybe even what kind of clothes we wear, what kind of houses we live in, what kind of cars we drive. They're powerful. And so I want to talk about the Bible as story because I think that um, sometimes we miss out on engaging with it the way that we were supposed to engage with it. The Bible tells one story from beginning to end and there's one central character and his name is not my name or your name. He reigns over all. The whole story is about him. The whole story is for him. He works everything together for his purposes through the story. And <clears throat> we are intended to see the world through the lens of that story. That's what I believe. Uh, I'm going to read Psalm 33 to sort of kick this off because I think that it uh, really hits kind of like some of the key elements of this story. And uh, it's really beautiful as well. It's going to be on the screen behind me here. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn uh, there. If you have, you know, a, a smartphone or a tablet, don't, um, don't feel like I'm going to judge you, think you're texting or tweeting how bad of a speaker I am or anything like that. <laughs> Although if you do that, that's rude. <laughs> The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He gave the sea its boundaries and he locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let everyone in the world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. When he spoke, the world began. The world that you and I live in was all birthed through his word. It appeared at his command. The Lord shatters the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but his plans, the Lord's plans, stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen for his own. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne, he observes all who live on the earth. Now, the interesting thing about that commercial that I showed you earlier was that as we walk through our lives in this culture, we are interacting with story at an unprecedented level. We are engaging with more stories probably than we were ever supposed to. Uh, people, uh, companies, politicians, I mean, anyone who wants you to want something from you. They're trying to give you a story. And so perhaps there are stories out there that are not true. Perhaps there are stories out there that are false. Now, how would you or I make a determination about which stories are true and which ones are false. And isn't it possible that we could live in a culture that even we ourselves could be wrapped up in a life that has been formed by false stories? I think it's entirely possible. So the message today and the journey <clears throat> that's launching on February 22nd, which Brian and Nicole talked about, are focused around this idea of story. What if we, as a group of people, were collectively formed by God's story more than we were formed by any other story? What if our community was shaped by the themes that are present here more than they were shaped by the themes that are present and celebrated in our culture. What would change? What would be different? I mean, where are the conflicts uh, between God's story and the stories that some of us have been trained up to believe? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning, kind of. Uh, just kind of give kind of a, a little glimpse of that. And then the whole journey is about that. The whole journey is, here's the story of God. You want to live in it. 
Or do you want to live in a different one? And how would our lives look different? How would they be shaped differently if we allowed ourselves to be transformed by the story that this tells from beginning to end about a good creator king who is working to restore everything that's broken? I'm going to give kind of an overview of the biblical story today just from one angle. And it's, it's, not, it's not my angle. It's, uh, it's an angle that I've got from uh, one of the leading theologians of our time named uh, N.T. Wright, who is, uh, he's a brilliant guy. But I've adjusted, I've amended his, uh, his thoughts here a little bit uh, to my own. But the concept is his. He talks about the biblical story in five acts. A-C-T-S. I have trouble saying that word. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just bad at English, but uh, Acts. Lindsay and I just went to Cinderella on Broadway down at the Aronoff Center the other night to celebrate her birthday. And so when we got there, we sat down and we opened up the, the playbill and it had Act 1. And then it talked about everything that would happen in Act 1. And then there was an intermission. And then Act 2, and it had everything that would happen. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. When N.T. Wright talks about this, he's talking about five, um, five stage arrangements kind of thing. These five major things that happen. And so this is a simplified way of looking at the story. Uh, but the whole story is focused on the union of God's reality and human's reality. Or you might call it heaven and earth. The union of heaven and earth. So... There's going to be some things up here that pop up that sort of display this visually as I talk about them. Act one is the beginning. God creates everything and heaven and earth are one. They come together in one big circle. They're perfectly united. This is a place where God reigns perfectly and fully. Everything, therefore, is how it should be. Everything is how it should be. Nothing is wrong. Uh, humans, God, animals, all of the created order, they all live in perfect harmony. The Hebrews would call it shalom, the interwebbing of all created things uh, into harmony. And so everything was that way, lived perfectly under the rule of God. But in act one, very quickly what happens is that humans reject the rule and reign of God. And dysfunction is inserted into a functional system and things begin to spiral out of control. Actually, very quickly, as you read Genesis 1 through 6, I mean, things just they spiral out of control very, very quickly, like a, a small crack in, in the wall of a dam. Uh, and with the pressure of the water kind of against it, you know, kind of continues the, uh, to to exploit the crack and eventually just, you know, the whole world floods with sin and all of us are exposed to it. All of us have been guilty of this. We've all kind of rejected God. So this is, this is our story, right? We can't just look at the first humans and be like, you idiots. I mean, we probably would have done the same thing, but that's what happens. Act one, everything is good. And then everything is not good. And then intermission. <laughs> and so what we have in the first act is, uh, at the end of the first act, is God, uh, heaven and earth separated. God's reality and human's reality separated. Humans can no longer be in the presence of God. Well, act two begins with God calling, apart, or calling out, setting apart a family. And through this family, he plans to bring about the redemption of all things. And you can see that these, uh, in this act, <clears throat> heaven and earth intersect, but not totally. Just uh, in a small part, they intersect. And they intersect in a place called the temple. So God sets apart a group of people called the Israelites. He makes a covenant with them. He says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your king. You're not going to have a human king. I'm going to be your king, and I'm going to live in this temple in this room, but no one could go in. Only one guy named the high, well, it wasn't his name, it was his title. The high, the high priest could go in one time 
once a year. So, I mean, this wasn't like total access. This was a, a very serious thing. And he had to go in the right way. Otherwise, things turned out badly for him because you don't walk into God's presence flippantly. This only happened in the temple. Heaven and earth are intersected in the temple. God's presence is among the people once again. But the same thing happens. The Israelites reject the presence of God. They, they say, we don't want you as our king. They actually go to uh, the, the prophet Samuel and they say, this whole thing where God is king, we don't like it. <laughs> we want to do something else. How about we get a human king just like everybody else? That'd be, that'd be great. And we all know that that's probably not going to pan out very well. Same thing happens. So Israel in, in Act 2 actually rejects the reign of God as well. Act 3 is completely and utterly surprising. But if you're conditioned to this story, it might not come across as surprising to you. God becomes a human. God actually becomes one of us, lives among us, and then suffers and dies. Why did he suffer and die? Well, ultimately, it was God's plan. But the people that God used to sort of get to that point were the people, the religious leaders who had been waiting for this Messiah. And guess what they did? They rejected the reign of God once again. They said, we don't, we don't want this Messiah or you're, you're uh, saying bad things. You're blaspheming God by saying that you are God himself. And so uh, we reject you. And so they rejected the reign of God once again, because Jesus walked around talking about the kingdom of God, saying, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus was ushering in this new age, this, uh, this age of the kingdom of God, and the religious leaders rejected the kingdom of God. They rejected it. Do you see a pattern? God uh, comes to live uh, and God has his presence among people, people reject it. Jesus is crucified. He dies, but he resurrects. His resurrection leads us into act four, which the disciples were hoping was the final act. In Acts one, they uh, are with Jesus and they say, hey, is this it? Is this the culmination? Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this it? Are you going to uh, become king and sort of put all nations under your feet? And uh, I like to say, Jesus said, no, I'm about to leave, actually, in five minutes. <laughs> I'm just about to leave. So no, that's not happening right now. <clears throat> and he ascends into heaven and then sends his spirit to be with his disciples with his church and gives them the commission to go into all the world and be witnesses that they have seen the king. The king is here and his kingdom has come and you can be a part of it. I'm gonna come back to act four in just a second, um, but I, I just wanna say very briefly, again, heaven and earth intersect somewhat. Again, in the temple, only Paul says this time, the temple, is the body of believers on the earth. When we all gather together, uh, we are like bricks being built, stones being built one on top of uh, one another into a, a house for God. And that God's presence lives in the middle of us. So people should be able to look at us and see what is the kingdom of God like? But I'm gonna come back to that and just say, okay, that's how I'm gonna close. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> act five, isn't this weird? Like we know how the story ends. It's just kind of unique, right? We've already been told what act five is, which is the, uh, the coming back of heaven and earth once again. What that means is that uh, humans who acknowledge the lordship of Jesus, 
those who, uh, those who will come under the submission of his kingship and live in his kingdom will once again live in perfect harmony with all of creation. He will make all things new. He will come back, he is returning, and he is making all things new. So that, that, that's the end. That's how it ends. Act five, we get to live in this perfect kingdom forever. So the question is, how will we live in act four? You might have caught that, that act four is still happening. Which is interesting because we all have these other stories that we're chasing. We have these other things that we're pursuing with life because we think they're important. We have these other stories that we're being formed by that might actually distract us from living as full participants in the one true story that is happening all around us. So how will we live then as participants in this story in act four? That's the question. And it's a question that is actually only answered, not intellectually, but by our lives, right? There's not just, a, not just an answer that says, well, here's how we will live. That's not how you answer that question. You answer that question by joining with God in his mission, which we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks, in the restoration of all things. Here's kind of the challenge for this morning that I want to leave you with. Since there are so many stories floating around, since we have the opportunity to engage with so many different ideas about what life is, why we're here, what we should be pursuing and all that, how do we know which stories are forming us? How do we know that those TV commercials and those TV episodes and those movies and those cultural expectations, how do we know that they haven't tricked us into living for something that's not true? Well, I think the only way is reflection through the Holy Spirit and allowing God to reveal which stories you've been chasing after, which stories we've been chasing after as a community. I think there's also some, hopefully some dreaming involved that uh, allows us to sort of ask the question, what would our community look like if we were really formed by this story of God. And that's ultimately the hope of the journey, that eight week series, uh, as we gather in small groups and do our weekly challenges and all that. The hope is that we will learn to be formed by the story of God. This is the greatest story that's ever been told. And it's the one true story. And you and I are invited to be a part of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I pray that as we come to you and sing a little bit more, and as we pray together, that you would just birth something in us, that you would spark something in us that causes us to ask the right questions about who we are and uh, what we're here for and how we can participate in your story. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.